Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to the another interesting session of the seventh lecture workshop on transdisciplinary areas of research and teaching by Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Awardees. Today we have with us Professor Sumit Ardas, who is a Bhatnagar Awardee in Physical Sciences, the year 1998, and is currently with the Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Kentucky, U.S. And he'll be talking to us today on the topic, Deconstructing Space. He did his BSc in Physics from Presidency College, University of Calcutta in 1977, MSc in Physics, University of Calcutta in 1979, and PhD in Physics from University of Chicago in 1983. He was postdoctoral fellow, Fermi National Accelerator Lab during 1983 to 85, postdoctoral fellow at California Institute of Technology during 1985 to 87, and a fellow a reader professor at TIFR, that is Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, during 1987 to 2002. He is also professor at University of Kentucky thereafter from 2002 onwards at present, and Arts and Science Distinguished Professor and Jack and Linda Gill Eminent Professor at University of Kentucky since 2020. He is an elected fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences and received the SS Bhatnagar Award and was also the Yukawa Visiting Professor at University of Kyoto. His research interests are Gauss theories of strong interaction, string theory, quantum aspects of black hole, quantum quench, and non-equilibrium physics. I welcome uh, Professor Das on behalf of the organizers, that is the India Lopadhyay College, University of Delhi, and the National Academy of Sciences, India, Delhi chapter. Welcome, sir. So you can please go ahead and okay. share your screen. Thank you very much. Thank you for, um, for attending this webinar and thank you, Dr. Saxena, for giving me the opportunity to share some of the things which I'm excited about for a while. I'll, uh, for those in the audience who are from a physics background, I, sh I should apologize because I'm not going to use any equations in this talk. So many of the things which I'll be talking about are mostly concepts, but by and large, uh, you should, uh, if you have any questions of putting in the math in, um, there's of course a, a math behind everything I say, uh, I could try to do so. Okay, so let me begin with what we learn in high school textbooks about fundamental forces. We learn that there are four known fundamental forces which are responsible for a multitude of phenomena around us. The first one is electromagnetism that basically accounts for almost most of the stuff we see around. And then there are the weak interactions. These are the forces which lead to radioactivity and beta decay. Perhaps more significantly, these also are responsible for causing reactions which make the sun shine so that we can exist. Then there are strong interactions. These are strong forces which bind some fundamental constituents of matter called quarks inside protons and nuclei and in turn hold them inside nucleon. Of course, an atom can exist because a nucleon, a, a nucleus can exist. So this is also at the basis of our existence. And finally, there is gravity. Gravity, of course, is the earliest recognizable force. And gravity has this property that unlike the other forces, it's universally attractive as was realized by Newton many, many years ago. It's responsible for everything else in the universe, in particular, uh, when we go to very large scale, when we talk of the universe as a whole, gravity is the dominant force simply because there is no chance of cancellation as would happen for charge, as, as would happen, for example, for uh, electromagnetism, where the forces can cancel each other. That's not possible in gravity, which is why gravity is the main force 
which account for the large scale structure of the universe. It is remarkable that of all these forces, the first three, namely electromagnetism, weak interactions, and strong interactions, are in fact described in very similar terms. This language is called gauge theory. And one can think of these forces as the result of exchange of particles. These particles are called force carriers. They are particles which have names like photons, W bosons, Z bosons, gluons. Doesn't matter. It's sort of this is uh, it's sort of analogous to these two people who are on a skating rink and they're exchanging balls. And as they exchange balls, they experience a force. The thing about these forces is pretty much like the skating rink, which is there once and for all, these forces all happens in a fixed space time. There is a certain notion of space we have, there is a certain notion of time, and these forces don't play around with these notions of space and time. Electromagnetism, of course, has a perhaps more familiar classical description, and this is what you learn in school. You, you know, place a magnet on a piece of paper, put some iron filings around, and you'll see these patterns. These patterns are formed by the the iron filings follow what are called lines of forces. And the idea about this is that the way this iron filing reacts to the presence of a magnet is that the magnet first sets around itself a field of force, and then whatever this iron or whatever magnetic material feels that field of force. So it's like a two-step process. Strangely, at the classical level, as we now know very well, gravity looks very different. Because as Einstein famously realized, gravity is not really a force in the usual sense. It's a manifestation of what is called a curvature of space-time. This is the theory of general relativity. A kind of, again, a kind of pictorial Many pictorial representation of this idea is that you take a thin rubber sheet, you put a big ball on the rubber sheet, it bends that ball. And if you take a small pinball around it, it's going to follow the lines of shortest parts on this sheet. But because the sheet is curved, the lines of shortest part, the shortest parts themselves are curved in this embedding space. And we might alternatively think of that it is coming from some force. This is the way we think about the way the Earth goes around the sun, for example. But the thing what this makes is, since gravity is a manifestation of curvature of space-time, space-time itself is dynamical. And one consequence of that is gravitational wave. Here is a computer simulation of a merger of two very massive objects called black holes. And as that merger happens, it sends out these ripples of curvatures in space-time, pretty much like ripples of water waves when you throw a pebble in a lake. These waves were experimentally discovered not too far ago in 2015, precisely 100 years after they were predicted by Einstein. Now, electricity, magnetism, radioactivity, nuclear forces, as I said, are all sort of like this, exchanging particles. So the question arises, the, 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 all these forces, these three forces are described by the laws of quantum mechanics. And so the question arises, what does it mean to talk about quantum gravity 
because if we talk about quantum gravity, you must mean that you are quantizing space-time itself. So before delving into that, let me give you a quick uh, sort of impressionistic view of what do we mean by quantum fields. So let's talk about the classical theory of point particles. As we learn in elementary physics, if I tell you the position and the velocity of a particle at any given time, and those two quantities can be specified independently, and once they are specified at one time, the laws of motion determine them or for all future time. Another way of talking about it is that there is a notion of a trajectory of a particle. So here is the trajectory of a ball thrown from the ground high in the air, and it goes up and comes down at every point and every intermediate time. It also runs backwards for some reason. At every intermediate time, I can tell you, this is the position, this is the velocity of the particle. In the quantum theory of particles, we cannot determine the position and the velocity of a particle simultaneously to arbitrary accuracy. This is the content of what is called an uncertainty principle. This another language we use to describe this fact is to say that the particle has a quantum jitter or quantum fluctuations. Since we cannot determine the position and velocity of a particle to arbitrary accuracy, there is no well-defined notion of a trajectory of a particle. Rather, quantum mechanics provides an answer to the following question. And the question is as follows. Suppose at some time t, t equal to zero, some initial time, the particle is at some location which I call A. Let me try to get a pointer out. Can you see the pointer? Yeah, I can okay. see that. Okay. So I tell you that the particle is at position A at some given time t equal to zero. And the question which quantum mechanics asks and quantum mechanics claim, this is the only question, in fact, you can ask, is what is how likely it is to find the same particle at the location B at some later time. There is, in particular, there is no meaning to the question of where was the particle in between. Once you have asked this question, that what is, what is the probability of finding this particle at this location B, there is no notion of what it was doing in between the time t equal to 0 and t equal to 1. One way of thinking about this is to consider a large number of imaginary identical copies of the particles under identical conditions. We call them realizations of the same system. In each of this realization, the particle goes along a different trajectory. And to calculate the probability of the particle at the time, at probability that the particle is at B at time t equal to one, what one needs to do is to consider all possible paths between A and B, calculate a certain quantity along this path, which quantum mechanics tells you what to do, and add them up in a certain rule. The same physics hold for fields of force. In ordinary classical physics, one can measure the electric and magnetic fields at a point to arbitrary accuracy. But in quantum mechanics, pretty much, so the electric and magnetic field are analogous to the position and the momentum of a particle. 
In quantum mechanics, one cannot measure both the electric and magnetic field at a point to arbitrary accuracy. They are also subject to an uncertainty relation and the electromagnetic field has a quantum jitter. Now, all these are words, but I should tell you, of course, we have an extremely precise understanding of what these words means in terms of the mathematical theory of quantum theory of fields. And this precise understanding exists not only for electromagnetism, but for weak interactions and strong interactions as well. The, the fact that these fields have this quantum jitter, this is a computer simulation of what a typical configuration in, in a theory of strong interactions is. The various colors tell you, in a sense, the electric and magnetic fields at a point. And as you can see, they sort of fluctuate. Now, since gravity is a manifestation of curvature of space-time, if I carry through the same idea to gravity, what this would mean that in quantum gravity, space-time itself has a quantum jitter. So this is not a real picture of what quantum gravity looks like, but this is an artist's imagination what it could look like if we were to understand quantum gravity. Interestingly, finding a precise understanding of this phrase, the phrase being space-time has a quantum jitter, has been rather difficult. And this continues to be a big challenge in physics. A little bit of history. In fact, even before the discovery of quantum mechanics in its final form, but after the discovery of what is called the old quantum, quantum theory, Einstein himself realized that one needs to treat gravity quantum mechanically. His argument was that follows, quantum mechanics was discovered in order to solve a paradox in classical electromagnetism. So what people, the paradox was the following. If you, as you probably know, an atom is made out of nuclei and there's an electron which we supposed to go around that nuclei. It was also known that a charged particle undergoing some acceleration radiates electromagnetic waves. And the puzzle was, why doesn't the electron just lose all its energy by emitting photons, namely light, and falling into the nuclei? However, if that happens, then of course an atom will be totally unstable. Quantum mechanics solved this problem by thinking about the problem in completely different terms. Einstein's point was that this, the same thing should hold for gravitation. And therefore, there has to be a quantum theory of gravitation. Of course, there was no experimental evidence that there one needs a quantum theory of gravitation. Even today, if you ask, is there a direct experimental reason why we should invent a quantum theory of gravitation? An answer is probably no. However, in physics, we don't want to describe phenomena piecewise, like one theory for one kind of phenomena, another theory for another kind of phenomena. We also require that these theories are internally consistent with each other. And it is this question of internal consistency of theories which describe different phenomena, which forces us to think about quantum gravity. It turned out to be rather frustrating to naively combine the laws of quantum mechanics and law, quantum um, general relativity. 
In fact, physicists started pondering about this issue almost immediately after the birth of quantum mechanics in 1925. In 1929, Pauli and Heisenberg performed the first quantization of the electromagnetic field, and they asserted that the same method will work for gravity. In 1934, in Soviet Union, this guy called Madve Bronstein wrote a rather insightful paper in the problem, which we'll come back to later, pointing out that this is not so easy. And in fact, in 1938, Heisenberg himself realized that applying the usual rules of quantum mechanics will probably not work because gravity becomes so strong at short distances. Over the past 90 years or so, these problems, maybe 100 years now, I think, have become more and more sharply defined and a multitude of approaches have been proposed to address them. Almost all these serious approaches lead to a rather radical conclusion. And the conclusion is that our usual notions of space and time cannot be fundamental. This echoes some prophetic words of this physicist called Bronstein in 1936. And I'll just read out, and this is what he wrote, the elimination of logical inconsistencies requires a radical reconstruction of the theory and perhaps also the rejection of our ordinary concepts of space and time, replacing them by some much deeper and non-evident concepts. What are those non-evidence concepts? Over the past three decades, one candidate has emerged from considerations in string theory, which has turned out to be remarkably fruitful and long consistent. Interestingly, its historical origin is in a rather different field. And this is the field of strong interactions. The theory of strong interactions is called quantum chromodynamics. Now, in a quantum theory of electromagnetism, I said electric and magnetic fields at each point in space and at each instant of time fluctuate. What does this mean? For example, if in a two-dimensional space, we measure the magnitude of the electric field, a snapshot would look like this. It's like 1.2 here. 0 0.9 here, 2.7 here. And at an, another realization of the same system, it would sort of look like that. These numbers change not because we are evolving in time, but because we are con considering possible realizations of the same system. This is pretty much like the example I gave about the quantum mechanics of particles where you should consider all possible trajectories in different identical realizations of the same system. In quantum chromodynamics, these numbers are replaced by a, an array of numbers called, these are three by three matrices, and the entries of each of them fluctuate. These matrices are called the gauge fields of quantum chromodynamics. So they would sort of look like that. It turns out to be incredibly hard to solve this theory. The best approach we have so far is to approximate the space-time by a discrete set of points and perform numerical calculations. This is a subject called lattice gauge theory. However, there's a rather non-intuitive limit in which the things become somewhat better, though not completely solvable. This limit was invented by Gerard Etoft. And what is said is you took the theory of three by three matrices, theories where the different fields at different points are represented by three by three matrices, 
and replaced them by a theory of n by n matrices and took the limit n going to infinity. It all showed that in this limit, many experimentally known facts about scattering of strongly interacting particles called mesons become transparent. Things which are very hard to understand otherwise. And one of these facts is that these objects, which look point-like when you look at it from very far, are actually little strings. So this is a kind of a representation, say, of a particle called a pi meson. Very far away, these two are pretty close to each other. These, these are quarks. These red things are quarks. But however, if you look very closely, you find that there is a little string which joins the quark and an antiquark. Large NQCD has in fact several such n by n matrices at every point. But physicists always look for what I call the key under the lamppost. Of course, most of the time you don't find the key, but sometimes you find something else which may be interesting maybe a diamond. So what people did in the 1980s is to study toy models of QCD. And in the simplest toy model, what they considered is one n by n matrix at every point in space. Even that was turned out to be very hard. And say, what they did was to simplify the problem even further. They said, let's get rid of space completely. What we have is one a single matrix, and the matrix elements of the single matrix vary with time. And in addition, they have quantum fluctuations. So the I'm sort of representing these quantum fluctuations by having this, uh, this matrices and the matrix elements fluctuating. Now it turns out that if I have a single matrix, you can arrange these array of numbers in a way that the matrix is diagonal. What this means is that, you know, matrix sort of looks like this. There is a diagonal along which you have non-zero entries and rest of it are zero. Quantum fluctuations mean that it are these numbers along the diagonals which fluctuate. For example, in another identical copy of the same system, we'll have a different set of numbers along those diagonals. The good thing is that this mathematical problem of the quantum dynamics of a single matrix could be solved. And it was solved, in fact, long time ago. It turned out that this problem has a very precise connection with this idea of having little strings which join quarks and antiquarks, which was developed throughout the 1980s. Now, I've been talking about matrices and I've been talking about strings, but I also said we are dealing with a theory where there is no space to begin with. Normally, when we think about strings in the theory of quantum chromodynamics, of course, we have quarks and gluons. They're living in three space dimensions. And you would imagine that these strings live in these three space dimensions. But now we have just one matrix and there is no notion of space. It's an abstract theory, but which is mathematically still well defined. So the question arose that one couldn't possibly describe this theory in terms of things which are moving in space because there is no space to move in. But here, there was a big surprise. Now, let us now represent these numbers 
as points on a line. So I said, you can have these things diagonal. And what I have done here is arrange these numbers, sort of rearrange them as points on a line with increasing entries. So like this point is somewhere here. There is a point 4.86, it's somewhere there. If you wish, this is like representing this, these numbers. Then these various realizations of the system at any given time would look like this. In the first realization, this will be a set of points on this line. In the second realization, there are points which are slightly different and so on. If you wait a little, and look at these numbers in all these three copies of this system, they would have also changed a bit. And this is what we'll call time evolution. It appears that we can regard these numbers as positions of particles which can move on a line. And encouraged by this picture, we start calling this line a space. Now, when we are dealing with a very large number of particles, tracking each particle, like the way I have been doing here, is not very useful. What is useful is, in fact, to think in terms of the number of particles in a given interval on the line. That's a number density. It is pretty much like the familiar example of a box of gas. If I have a single molecule in a box, it's useful to think, trace down what the molecule is doing at every instant of time, because it, it is easy to keep track of this. If I have many molecules, maybe with enough computing power, you should be able to do that. But when we have really a very large number of molecules, like you know, the the gas molecule, the molecules of air in this room, you don't think it in terms of molecules, you think it in terms of the density of air, the viscosity of air, concepts which are what we call in physics coarse grain concepts. The important point is that when n is large, n was remember the the number of points on that line, even though the individual particles have very large quantum fluctuations, the quantum fluctuations of the density are small. And again, pretty much like a gas. In the lowest energy state, the density is time independent. So for example, this is like a profile of the density. Since quantum fluctuations are small, the theory which describes this dynamics is in fact a classical theory. At large but finite n, there are fluctuations and those fluctuations sort of look like this. And as you can see, what those fluctuations start looking like is like a sound wave. So a rather abstract mathematical theory of a single n by n matrix has now become something very familiar. It becomes a theory of waves, which are moving in one space dimensions. To begin with, there was no space, just one huge matrix. However, space emerges from the quantum dynamics of this matrix in this case, this is on a line, and what we get is a one-dimensional space. And there are waves in this one-dimensional emergent space which behave exactly the same way as sound waves will move, will propagate through a rod. One can form wave packets. They behave like little blobs of energy. And these blobs of energy can collide with each other like little particles. 
And all this drama is happening on a line which in the beginning actually did not exist. In fact, it turns out that when you look at this problem closely, what you find is that processes which look like this, waves and blobs which hit each other, can be explained in terms of gravitational forces. And these forces are somehow secretly present in the dynamics of the matrix elements. These are, however, approximate properties at low energies. At high energies, the description breaks down and we can no longer think of this as a theory in continuous space. So an abstract bunch of numbers written as a huge matrix becomes a one-dimensional line. And in this way of thinking, the notion of space and the local physics in this space is what we call emergent. It's an approximate description. It's an approximate description when this matrix is very large, and when the matrix is very large, these little points, these entries on the diagonal can be thought of little particles. There are too many of them. So it's useful to describe them in terms, not in terms of the particles, but in terms of the density of particles. And that is the description which is analogous. And we found that that description has an understanding in terms of gravitational forces. The fundamental description is in terms of an abstract matrix. This then is an example of what Bronstein called a non-evident concept. However, the real power of this idea comes when we consider more than one matrix. In more dimensions, you need to have more of these matrices and so the, for example, you have a system of two matrices and suppose we chose one of them to be diagonal and suppose we could choose in fact both of them to be diagonal, then we could regard these numbers as dots on a two-dimensional plane. So this is, for example, uh, a representation of these two matrices and these numbers are thought of the x coordinates of a point. Those numbers can be thought of y coordinates of a point. Once again, we might try to interpret these points as locations of particles in two spatial dimensions. And once again, when the matrices are large, when there are lots and lots of these points, we can think of them in terms of density of these particles, waves, of densities like sound waves and so on. Unfortunately, this thing doesn't work. And this is because in general, we cannot make both the matrices diagonal. Rather, what the picture looks like is as follows. These dots now represents locations of these diagonal entries. And there are off diagonal entries like this one and that one which can be thought of as little strings which join these drops. In another remarkable twist of history, the meaning of this abstract picture came from the physics of black holes. Now, in general relativity, black holes are objects from which nothing, not even light, can escape. These black holes are objects which are abundantly present in our universe. There are lots of them even in our own galaxy. And in fact, they are thought to be a key ingredient in the formation of galaxies to begin with. So here is a kind of a kind of artist depiction of what a black hole is. There is a certain surface called the horizon 
which has the property once you get inside this surface, you just fall in and that's it. You can never come out. In a paper which revolutionized the field forever, Stephen Hawking showed that when quantum effects are taken into account, a black hole is not really black, but it can emit radiation from a region from just outside the horizon. What he also found is that this radiation is pretty much like the radiation from a burning piece of coal, something which we call a thermal radiation. A thermal radiation is characterized by concepts like temperature, entropy, energy density, and things like that. But this raises a serious issue. And the key aspect of this issue is the following. Now, a thermal radiation normally has a microscopic origin. For example, consider a, a pieces of coal which are burning. We know microscopically, the coal is made out of molecules and atoms, and they are very excited. They de excite by releasing photons. These are packets of electromagnetic waves, and that's what we detect as radiation. Or, in other words, what we call thermal radiation is a kind of a approximate coarse grain description of this energy coming out. And when we describe this thing coming out in terms of radiation, we ignore many of the details of this whole process of many molecules in the coal which are burning. So if a black hole emits thermal radiation, the question arises, what is a black hole made of? What are the analogous entities like atoms of molecules inside a black hole. And the funny thing is that in the classical theory of gravity, it turns out that this question has a rather boring answer. This, this is related to a set of theorems in general relativity, which have this interesting name called no hair theorems, which basically tells you that in the context of classical theory of gravity, it is meaningless to ask if a black hole is made out of neutrons or is it made out of elephants, which is sometimes you know, codified by Chandra Shekhar's sentence, the black holes of nature are the most perfect macroscopic objects there are in nature. They're the simplest objects as well. And one of the reasons for this simplicity is the fact that in classical general relativity, all you know about the black hole are its mass, its charge, and its spin. So if this was the entire story, it is rather puzzling because it would say there is no microscopic ingredient of a black hole because if there were, you would be able to detect it from outside. And these theorems tell you that you cannot. Now, this is, of course, what classical general relativity tells you. Rather surprisingly, during the period, a three-year period from 1995 to 1998, it was realized that there is a large class of black holes in a certain theory, which I'll not describe, in fact, have a microscopic structure. The quantum features of those black holes are very important for, to realize this. And in fact, the mathematical theory which describes this microscopic structure is precisely the theory of many matrices, which I just talked about. The structure is sort of looks like this. If you look, look very closely inside the black hole, you'll find objects which are looking like that. In this microscopic theory, there is 
neither a notion of space with a smaller number of dimensions or there is no notion of space at all. Yet, the macroscopic properties of this bunch of things are identical to the macroscopic properties of black holes. This is pretty much like what happens in, in normal experience. If you take a little piece of rock salt, you can view it as a rock and you look closely, it looks like a crystal. The description in terms of a crystal must of course predict the description in terms of a rock. Similarly for black holes. Indeed, this does happen for these classes of black holes. The earliest results were for very special black holes. And now we have much stronger results from numerical calculations. A process of this Hawking radiation from black holes microscopically looks like this. Macroscopically, it looks like this. In 1997, Maldasena, in fact, argued that this kind of emergence of additional dimensions of space happens not only just for black holes, but for other interesting classes of space times. We don't quite know the story in its full generality, but there are general arguments that this is indeed the case. It is summarized by saying, the world is a hologram and hologram, in a hologram, you can encode everything that's happening in three dimensional space on a two dimensional on a two dimensional hologram and you have to decode that hologram to reconstruct the three dimensional space what has been argued is that the gravitational physics of our ordinary three dimensional space can be encoded in terms of a theory of either low theory of lower dimensional space or in a theory with no space at all. Unlike the case of a single matrix where the mathematical theory was very concrete, we don't have a derivation of this correspondence between a theory of several matrices and a gravitational theory. That is why we call it a conjecture. But a conjecture which is supported by numerous pieces of evidence. There are some other classes of theories where there is almost a derivation, but the gravity which comes from these theories is not the usual Einsteinian general relativity. What is quantum gravity and the fluctuating space-time? We have come to the conclusion that our usual intuitive notion of space is not really fundamental. Rather, it provides an approximate description which is more exact, but abstract. When the matrices are huge, the emergent space is smooth and classical. This is the regime where we can ignore the quantum effects of gravity. The quantum effects of gravity appear when the matrices are finite in size, and the description in terms of matrices remain exact. And this is the way we can think about a space-time which has quantum fluctuations. Let us return to the situation where we actually get a smooth space-time from this abstract theory of matrices. And I'm going to ask the question, can we always approximate this space-time in this fashion. There is a lot of evidence now which indicates that the emergent space really looks like a smooth space when the system has a very key property of quantum mechanics, which is called entanglement. So let me briefly talk about what is entanglement. This is a very funny property of quantum mechanics first highlighted in this famous paper of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and of course, last year's Nobel Prize, 
was for a direct experimental sort of evidence for this entanglement. Now, I'll give it in terms of an example which was invented by David Bohm. And it concerns elementary particles like electrons, protons, and neutrons. They have a property which is called spin. Now, in quantum mechanics, as I said, measurements are probabilistic. So, in a typical state, if you measure this quantity called spin in a certain direction, the result will be probabilistic. It can be plus half or minus half. These outcomes are sometimes called spin up or spin down. However, if your particle is already in the spin half state, plus half, then any measure will be continue to yield a result of plus half. Consider now a decay of a particle which doesn't have a spin, which has spin zero, into two spin half particles. A concrete example is a pion going into an electron and its antiparticle called a positron. So the total spin of the electron and the positron is zero. This means, however, that neither has a definite spin in some direction. However, if you measure the spin, for example, of the electron in some directions, like this is the electron, say green one is the electron, the positron has to have exactly the opposite spin. And this will continue to happen even if we make the measurement when the two particles are separated by a very large distance. Say, for example, one of the particles is on the Earth, the other particle is on the Moon. So this is, a, by itself, this is not very strange. What is strange prediction of quantum mechanics is the following. Now, suppose I measure the spin of the electron in a direction which is not like this. So the electron spin is measured in this direction, whereas out there in some distant galaxy, the spin of the positron is measured in the perpendicular direction. Quantum mechanics has a definite prediction for what your friend in the other galaxy is going to measure. And in fact, what the prediction tells you is that your friend will instantly know what kind of measurement you made. Did you measure the spin in this direction, vertical direction, or did you measure the spin in the horizontal direction? Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen concluded that this property of quantum mechanics violated our usual notions of locality. So they call it spooky action at a distance. In fact, it turns out it does not violate any principle of locality. Rather, it exposes the fact that the state of the electron-positron system is something which we call an entangled state. There are now many experiments which have measured directly this counterintuitive result of quantum mechanics. And in fact, the, the, the current frontier of computation is quantum computation. And the quantum computation is, is sort of based upon this property of quantum mechanics called entanglement. Now, this kind of entanglement can appear between two regions of space. This is called spatial entanglement. For example, this is a picture of space and this is some sub-region called A. The rest of it is called B. And in a state which is entangled, you can 
means that various things in A can be entangled with things in B. It turns out, for reasons which we don't completely understand, that all known notions of emergent space, this picture we have been advertising, namely something which looks microscopically in terms of these abstract matrices and looking like a smooth space-time in a coarse grain description works only when the stuff on the left is highly entangled. The problem is, however, when space-time is itself dynamical as it is in a theory of gravity, this is a very tricky quantity to define precisely. Because if I say there is a region A, that region itself is fluctuating. In fact, on the other hand, entanglement plays a very key role in understanding Hawking radiation because these pairs of particles which I talked about are in fact highly entangled. To understand this issue, we went back to cases where we do understand the emergence of space from fundamental entities. And it turns out that the quantum mechanics on the left-hand side is conventional. We can therefore understand these notions of entanglement. And what we need to understand is the, road, is the notion of a region of the right side in terms of things on the left side. This is what we managed to do in a, in a few recent papers with my colleagues at the Tata Institute and my students over here. And we came up with such a precise notion on in this picture, which becomes an approximate notion in this picture. Uh, I think my time is almost up, so I'll skip some other aspects and get back to another issue. We talked about emergent space. space. We talked about describing space not in terms of what we normally would think to describe space, but in terms of more abstract quantities. What about emergent time? In everything I have done, we had an a priori notion of time and people have speculated, can we get rid of that too? There are several ideas, but none of these ideas have attained their comfortable level of concreteness. I would like to believe that this will indeed happen in the future and that will be the key to our understanding of a meaning of the Big Bang, which is kind of a like of a time beginning from nothing. But I think I'm getting into the stage of a wishful thinking and I should really shut up. Rather, let me thank my collaborators from many parts of the world which have talking to my collaborators have certainly helped me in understanding many aspects of what I just described. I'd like to thank um, the various organizations which have funded my research. And finally, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Das, for explaining such a complex topic uh, in such a easy manner and uh, it uh, this last 60 minutes i hope uh, must have been a wonderful experience uh, for all the attendees who are attending this particular session well there are a few questions which have been shared by the attendees uh, sure yeah I, i'll just share my slides i hope uh, the two are compliments <laughs> and uh, the first one i suppose is a question <laughs> Oh my God, these are really deep questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so the first question is, can consciousness be explained by quantum physics? So can you comment on the difference between quantum physics, quantum chemistry, quantum biology, and quantum computer? For the first part of the question, I have nothing to say. I don't think anybody really understands what is consciousness. In fact, uh, just to define what we mean by consciousness uh, is a big problem. I think it's uh, 
it's more a problem in philosophy, which sometimes precedes when it becomes a problem in science. I hope that happens in the future, but I think it hasn't happened. And um, I really have nothing to say about that. Uh, the second question is about the difference between quantum physics, quantum chemistry, quantum biology, and quantum computer. And my answer is there is no difference. It's all the same. Um, quantum chemistry is an application of quantum physics to the realm of atoms and molecules. Quantum biology, I don't quite know what that means, but uh, I... I I presume what you meant was manifestations of quantum phenomena in biological phenomena, and that certainly happens. Um, quantum computer, as I just said, is that uh, it's intimately tied to quantum mechanics. In fact, it's intimately tied to this notion of entanglement in quantum mechanics. Um, people have made progress in that actually making quantum computers and this is not a speculation anymore like um, when i was a postdoctoral fellow at caltech i had the great uh, uh, i had the great fortune of knowing richard feynman and that was the time feynman was beginning to think about theories of quantum computation and this was in the uh, 1980s uh, deep thinking, but I don't think even Feynman would have thought that in another 40 years, people would be making quantum computers. And that's certainly going to happen. That's the next frontier. Uh, the second uh, compliments, thank you very much. I hope, uh, I, I'm pretty sure I was not able to really explain things, but I hope that I have been able to inspire you to think about uh, this rather uh, abstract. It, it, I wanted to give you a feeling of how uh, sometimes very abstract notions, which is in the realm of physics all the time, uh, can actually address questions which are very much there and which are very much there to... Uh, to understand. And I hope that uh, I've been able to uh, give you a little um, uh, little taste for this kind of thinking, which uh, me and many of my colleagues love very much. And uh, Dr. Saxena, I lost the third question. Can you show the slide again, please? Oh, thank you again. You're most welcome. It was really a pleasure, I must say, to, uh, to share my excitement about this field. And uh, all, all I can say is that I hope in the next 10, 20 years, much of I said would be proven to be right. And much of what I said would be proven to be wrong. That's the way science is. And uh, I hope you appreciate the way science works. It's not by having a dogma about something, but having, a, having an idea, pursuing that idea, and the ability to give up that idea when things turn out to be otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Das, for taking up all possible questions. And I hope that if any uh, way you are planning to come to India, we may have a one-on-one -on -one meeting in person also for the attendees. So Surely. I, sure. I do spend a lot of time in India every year at, at the Tata Institute where I'm an adjunct faculty. Uh, I seldom go to Delhi, but if I do, yes. I'll certainly let you know. It, it will be an honor and a pleasure for all of us. Uh, so thank you. thank you very much. And on okay. behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank the speaker, Professor Das, and to all the attendees who have been there with us for this particular webinar. And hope to see you all in our future upcoming events. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.